Well, never in our lifetime has a war been viewed so openly right around the world. When Russia invaded Ukraine last week, some of social media's youngest users experienced the conflict from the front lines on TikTok and other social media platforms. In one aspect, this is helpful because it allows comprehensive coverage of what is unfolding instantaneously, but it also is being used as a weapon for disinformation, propaganda and gruelling bloody footage. Professor Karen Freeberg is a social media and strategic communication expert from the University of Louisville in Kentucky and Dr Karen Sutherland from the University of Sunshine Coast. Welcome to you both. Now we'll get straight into it, Professor Freeberg. Videos of people huddling and crying in bomb shelters, explosions, blood blasting and missiles streaking across Ukrainian cities took over the app from its usual offerings of, say, fashion or fitness and dance videos. It's quite confronting and a different change here. What role has social media played in the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Yes, I mean, social media is basically brought forth the war in a new light. So we are witnessing um, what is happening on the ground in various formats. And so it's almost like it's become a digital warfare in itself. And it is important for us to kind of look at what is real, but also realize the growing um, rise of um, misinformation as well, because there's been a lot of co coverage that has been, you know, covered across, you know, these different platforms that have shown like what is real, what is rumor, what is fake. And it's really, been a due diligence of a lot of these platforms to really take ownership and say this has been verified, this is true versus not. And Carolyn Sutherland, it's our first social media war really. Just how dangerous can it be through, uh, I guess, in regards to that disinformation and, and fake images that we're seeing here? Because uh, the media obviously is responsible for, pu for pushing a certain narrative here. Absolutely. And and what often happens is the media will pick up things that then footage that they're seeing on social media and broadcast that even more widely. So it's really a matter of, of checking. And if you can't check the, the uh, credibility of, of a piece of content, it's better just not to share it. The other thing is we have people who have really no, no expertise in the area providing commentary on the topic as well, who suddenly jumped on board the latest the latest trend of this topic and this world issue and sharing insights that they're just not qualified to share. And I think that also helps with that spread of misinformation. But Professor Freeberg, it's also been a powerful tool for Ukrainians to go live with updates, photos and videos and showcase the brutality here. Is this a good way of educating people about what's really happening or should there be regulation around this kind of imagery, especially on social media platforms where there is a younger audience as well? There are calls now, I know, for big tech to sort of take action here. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we are seeing at the early stages like kind of the unfiltered view of war and we have seen people on the ground wanting to make sure that people um, outside of Ukraine are aware of what's going on because they really want to make other people outside, you know, around the world um, take action based on this. But there is, of course, um, war is, is very brutal. And as you said, um, these... Um, Visuals who are on these platforms, especially TikTok, on the other side, and so being exposed to these messages, um, it definitely has made a call to one of these platforms to say, "Should we put a warning ahead saying this uh, might be disturbing and stuff?" So all of this is happening in real time, and these platforms are basically being, being called in, saying, "You are basically being a media platform showcasing, you know, the the act of war. What are you going to be able to do about it?" So. It's, it's ever evolving and, and changing um, mm. day by day. And Karen Sutherland, I mean, nobody really, whatever oh, yeah. age you are, is equipped to deal with some of the footage and imagery that we're seeing out of there. I mean, bloody bodies. It doesn't matter what age you are, that is heartbreaking and, and disturbing to anybody's mental and emotional health, whether you're there or abroad. Uh, but uh, typically, social media has a younger audience what regulations need to be put in place to potentially stop them from seeing some of this footage, footage that they should never have seen at such a young age? Well, I know even I just scrolling through TikTok this morning, looking at the footage coming from Ukraine, there have been um, sort of screens put up saying this is disturbing content. Do you want to continue? And I don't know if that is, is enough. I mean, I, even I, I hesitated, but a younger user doesn't know what's behind that screen. So 
uh, yeah, I think I think more vetting. Um, I don't think AI is really that advanced yet to be able to really flag everything because the volume of content is just vast that's actually coming out. So yeah, I think um, trying to actually vet that stuff and prevent it from going live and, and, and being put out is probably the most important thing at this stage. And just parents, I think, just be mindful of what your kids are doing online and what they may be exposed to. I think the education around that and, um, and, and guiding and the guidance of parents in this area is really crucial because the platforms can't do it. They're not doing it as well as they should. So yes. we need to think of other ways. Yeah, absolutely. Some of that footage, as we said, is quite disturbing. Uh, thank both Karens. Thank you so much.